Hi, I'm Ulysses, and this is Music, Meaning, and Mystery, a podcast for the other musicians. Today, you're going to listen to my conversation with Sue Terry about her new course called The Metaphysics of Music. Now, this course is very exciting. It will be a five-day intensive course that you can attend live in the Ecuadorian Andes. Topics will be uh, incredible. <laughs> there will be using your intuition as well as your knowledge. There will be the sound as energy, um, the function of musicians in society, music as a force of influence, and so many incredible other topics that you can learn from a master musician, uh, Sue Terry. The course is <laughs> very reasonably priced, so I it's going to sell out because there are only 15 uh, spots available. So the information for this course are in the show notes. Uh, there will be Sue Terry's email and the website that gives you information about the course and uh, like a all the all how you can book your book your uh, class. So if you're planning a vacation in August, plan it in May because you get a discount on this already incredibly priced opportunity to learn from master musician Sue Terry about the metaphysics of music. So information in the show notes, check it out. And now the conversation with Sue Terry. Okay. So you have the esteem of being the first music, meaning, and mystery podcast guest to score a hat trick of appearances. <laughs> yeah, so this is appearance number three uh, for you. And uh, not enough as far as I'm concerned. Uh, oh, always, thank you. Yeah, I always love talking to you. And um, I wanted to uh, have a conversation with you about this course you've put together called the Met Metaphysics of Music. Um, first, I'm so glad that it exists. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's the first of its kind, but it's the only one I know in this uh, modern age of, you know, not that at all. So uh, much appreciated. Um, what spurned you into putting this uh, bold course together? Well, th this is actually something... I've been researching this for so many years and and then I just started getting the idea, you know, I should teach a course on this. I should share all of this stuff with um with people that are interested in you know, what well what is metaphysics? Metaphysics is a study of reality, right? So we need to study the reality of music. What's the nature or the nature of reality? What's the nature of reality of music? And you're right. No one really talks about that. They certainly don't talk about it in music school. So as I, as I got more and more deeply into studying these aspects of, of vibration and frequency and how, uh, vibration and frequency from sounds and from music is translated into other ways that we can perceive them like uh, the work of Hans Yeni who uh, created a um, method of displaying vibrations in a medium like sand or water or something like that Right. he got his ideas from Claudney who was before him who was experimenting with that same thing so i just started getting more and more into it and then i thought i'm going to teach this um, and uh, actually uh, the idea to teach it and and thinking about how i would have a course like that and how would it work so i made a basically a complete 
curriculum with modules and everything as if I were going to teach it at, at a university. And I thought that I might be able to teach it at a, a university near where I live. But what ended up happening is I sent the curriculum to my friend who is the founder of the Cuevas del Ilalo, which is this amazing international arts center, high atop a mountain in the Andes, mm -hmm. overlooks the city of Quito. Absolutely oh, amazing place. How when, appropriate, yeah. Yeah, so he fell in love with this idea and he said, look, we're going to make this happen. We're going to present it at the Cueva. So it's perfect because he already has events, international events where people come and and uh, they stay at the bottom of, of the mountain in a really nice hotel. All, you know, great meals, vegetarian, if you want that. And um, and then there's transportation up the mountain to take the course. So that's, in a nutshell, how it started. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So I wanted to take some of the, because you have a website, which will be linked to in the show notes. And there's a video uh, that outlines um, some of what you said and, and some more there, uh, what the course is about, and you have topics included. And I'd like to kind of use that as a springboard to go deeper into um, what is uh, going to be included in the course. And uh, also just for my own enrichment. <laughs> um, one of them being uh you've talked already about music as a type of energy um but you have here the function of music and musicians in society now i've been thinking a lot about this particular thing we on the podcast when in blog articles i've talked a lot about like you know what music is what does it do what are its special properties um but um I increasingly have found that that's just the beginning part. What music is for becomes, I think, is really more important because human beings, whatever we interact with anything, it's our immediate experience is what is this thing for? So a cup in, in, the, in our experience of it is a thing for drinking, right? A chair is a thing for sitting. So right. what what so is what's music? A musician? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's music for? You know, why, why do we even have music? And 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 uh, and and uh, exactly, what is a musician for? Well, you know, it's a deep question because in in tribal societies, everyone had a function. Even the little kid had a function. And so everyone knew, you know, let's take the Plains Ind Indians. I like to talk about them because if you know what your role is in the society, you're, you got to go out and hunt or you got to clean the corn or you got to fetch uh, kindling for the fire or whatever it is that you you have to do there's a set of chores that's associated and a set of responsibilities that's associated with that role and they didn't have stuff like mental illness and stress related disorders and um post traumatic you know stress disorder i mean all all of these things bulimia anorexia um, and all the kinds of like the di diagnostic and statistical manual keeps getting bigger every year because all of these <laughs> uh, disorders and syndromes and things are created and so that more drugs can be sold to treat them, right? So in tribal societies, that didn't exist because everyone had, everyone knew what they were there for everyone was 
there to do the thing that they were the, the set of responsibilities that they had. And if we, I think that's a great idea um, that we don't have mm -hmm. in modern society. Mm -hmm. People grow up not knowing why they're here, not knowing what their role is supposed to be and how they're contributing to the, their community. And so we end up with a lot of confused people, especially mm -hmm. young people. So that can't be a good thing. So why, why should we um, cultivate this idea of having a role? It's so that not only can we contribute more to society, but also our mental health, our spiritual health, and our physical health can also be better because we have a place. You know, place is, is really important. It's a, and that's kind of a metaphysical idea. You know, I don't mean like a place, a physical place. It's a place in the universe for you. So don't we all want to feel that we have a place in the universe? I think we do. So as a musician, we have to put some, not some, a lot, a lot of thought into what's our role. Mm -hmm. And I believe that musicians fulfill the role of a kind of shaman. And we don't really have shamans in modern society either so much it's a it's kind of a fringe thing but the, but what is a shaman a shaman is someone who can travel to another dimension another kind of reality find out information that pertains to you come back and give you that information so isn't that what we do when we play music? Ideally, we're trying to go to that other place where the magic part is. Mm -hmm. And there's always a duality. We there's always the just the basic quotidian daily existence that we have. You know, mm -hmm. maybe if we're out like playing some kids' bar mitzvah, maybe we're not, you know, in the most elevated spiritual state but we can get there i've I, i've gotten to that state on bar mitzvahs come on you know it it's possible to do so there's a lot of i think to to, to cultivate that ability as a musician we're talking now to cultivate that ability to go to these other dimensions for lack of a better word because I think when we're really in the zone of playing music, we are in another dimension. We're not, we're not in the daily world anymore. And then that's kind of the addiction of music, right? So we always want to keep getting to that place. And sometimes days go by and we don't get there. But that doesn't mean we stop practicing because we have to be in shape for when we do get there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So this is part of the part of our role. I think we're we're kind of modern day shamans, and this is why we have a big responsibility to our community, and our, our community is, you know, the people that we is that we interact with them. Mm -hmm. I think that musicians need now in order and we can even look at that in a marketing you know musicians are always complaining about they can't uh it's so hard to get a gig you get it 25 times <laughs> when you do get a gig your it's your responsibility to promote your own gig that you know when did that start happening that's fairly recent, you know. Hmm. First day someone told me, well, do you have a press kit? I was like, a press kit? 
What's that? Play? <laughs> Press kit. But yeah. now it's all about it's all about that now. It's all about the marketing. So because it's become so commercialized, what we do, you know, it's not even sacred anymore. To you know, that's why we're trying to keep looking for the sacred part, because that's what attracted us in the first place was th this magical thing about music. Hmm. So we have to go back to that feeling. We have to remember why, in the first place, we wanted to play music. Hmm. And then we have to say, all right, now we're out here in a marketplace. We didn't really want to be in a marketplace, but we we got in it because there's no more sacred element. And so we're just entertainers, mm -hmm. basically, to the world. And so now, how are we going to attract the attention of the people who we know? There, We know we have our listeners. We know we have people that will love what we are offering but where are they how do we reach them it's so hard hmm. and that that's why we have to keep honing our craft because we're competing with ai we're competing with child prodigies we're competing with international uh performers the internet all kinds of entertainment sports what have you there's just you know, it's not like in the old days when the battle of the bands in a in a little town, in a little village, that was the, the huge entertainment of the next six months. People were going to be talking about that. Hmm. So it's not like that anymore. So uh, there, there's just so much stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So it, the, this course is about... Um, not only strengthening the abilities of musicians because i want musicians to sign up for it but but it can also be for people who are just so passionate about music and maybe they don't play an instrument that's okay mm -hmm. but they want to know more about it because mm -hmm. i've known musicians uh, i've known uh, people and i'm sure you have too ulysses that they're not musicians but they just love music maybe they love music more than musicians do yeah, Cause yeah. They, right because they can't do it yeah yeah so there, there's there's a lot going on in there i have a, some thoughts um it sounds to me like there's a vision for the function of musicians uh, a sort of like here's what it could be and or here's how it ought to be or um here's how we can be inspired from our ancestors in a way that that they did musicians and then there's another thing of here's the immediate concern of of what a, a, the function of a musician should be which is um we've forgotten something so the function of a musician should be to remember what a musician is so which would hopefully lead to a more beautiful world where musicians know who they are <laughs> exactly because if they know who they are then when you listen to them you know who you are oh yes yeah it's like a recognition of home mm -hmm. yeah yeah hmm. i've been thinking a, a lot for a long time uh the what i used to think was context appropriate music so um, what's that yeah so <laughs> <laughs> so the 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 reason it's so uh, David Byrne wrote a book called How Music Works. I don't know if you read it. Um, no, I haven't read that. It's he's got some interesting theories, but there's a limit to how far he can go with them. But he's got this idea that the reason that 
say Gregorian chant sounds the way it does, it's because of the place it was sung. So, so the the architecture of a church does not lend itself to anything that's like percussive, really, right? It's it's better if it you have sustained notes that bounce back uh, rather than a lot of different notes because the notes bounce back and there could be like dissonance. You, you know what I mean? Like of the next note, the first note could bounce back on the second note if you're not careful, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, whereas this that wouldn't work in a place like the CBGB or something like that, right? So it, it got me thinking about there's music for certain things. Um, there is a guy I talked to, uh, he's a, a Hugan, is a, so he's a voodoo priest. And in his tradition, certain songs are meant for certain things. So there's a song for when your grandmother dies, and there's a song for when you celebrate a certain spirit, and there's a song for this and for that. And so you, in the same way that you wouldn't, it's kind of weird to play Iron Maiden if you have your uncle and his wife over for dinner, right? You need, <laughs> you know, so, but really what that is, is a, is a hint that music is meant to be in service of something, right? That, so the music the music isn't necessarily the main attraction uh, of, the, of a musical performance. It's meant to be for something, just like a musician is meant to be for a certain purpose. Totally. And yeah. th that's what it is with the Indian music. The ragas are designed to be played at a certain time, at a certain season, for a certain occasion. You know, there's some ragas that can only be played in the morning. Some can only be played in the evening. Some can only be played for this function, that function. Hmm. Yeah. And I often wonder, and, you know, there, there's a separation there. That you still have a separation between sacred music and secular music. And it's like, we don't have that anymore. You know, because even the worship musicians, they're out there hustling like everybody else. Right. Know, hustling in the marketplace mm -hmm. so that there there really is no separation in the west that that's exclusively um a kind of asian idea mm. that uh i always wonder you know if i was born in india what my life would as a musician would have been like mm. it would have been super different maybe uh the traditional churches uh have preserved some of that um at their liturgical services um but while yeah. you're there while, while you're there. there while you're there yeah 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 and and you know the the thing about gregorian chant um belonging to the church is interesting though because gregorian chant was actually based on chants from byzantium and and persia so mm. and and i'm i want to do some research into that i don't know how much i'll be able to find mm. but you know these um modal approaches to music certainly aren't only the bailiwick of the church Mm -hmm. you know, we hear them elsewhere. Sure. And, uh, but the power of it, I mean, I, I like to listen to them myself when I want to just calm down. I was even thinking of making a recording, a Shakuhachi recording mm. of Gregorian chants. That'd be cool, yeah. Yeah, that would be really cool. I started transcribing some of them. Hmm. But um, there was a an audio researcher named Alfred Tomatis, Dr. Tomatis, I don't know, like 100 years ago or something. And he was 
asked to, he was asked to be a consultant to one of the Benedictine churches who had a new director and the new director had come in and he thought that the monks spending six hours a day chanting Gregorian chants was a waste of time. So he was like, oh, come on, we can do better. So he canceled all the chanting. Oh, wow. Whoa. And all the, and yeah, and like, I think it was 70 out of the 95 monks got sick, really sick. And he, yeah. so he was consulted to come in and see, you know, what's wrong with them. And, uh, he reinstituted the chanting. And so guess what happened? <laughs> they all got better, they right? They all got better, yeah. Yeah. So there's a a power there that has a lot of aspects. You know, mm -hmm. we have the aspect of actually tone, at toning this is like toning. Toning is kind of a Western version of um, chanting a mantra or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So this is all, it's all of a piece, you know, it's just called by different things wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So you've got this vocalizing element where you're, you're creating a, a vibration that's resonating in, in your uh, resonant cavities. And that you're expressing to the outside world. So you're making an exchange there. Then you have also an aspect that doesn't even need anything to be vocalized. Because it has a an essence that is still there, whether it's silent or whether it's heard. Mm. And that's the thing with prayer because they say prayer prayer isn't the words of the prayer prayer is the feeling of the prayer prayer is like a state of being mm -hmm. so the music should be that way too the music is not a, a collection of notes that we're um, reading off like a ai um trumpet player <laughs> mm. it's a state of being mm -hmm. so a, a, a real musician i think your goal is that state of being mm. okay so that's mm. a kind of an extra thing that isn't talked about yeah and um it's certainly not taught so this is the kind of thing I want to go into, mm -hmm. not only the, the physical properties of sound and, and studying that and seeing how that all works, but also the spiritual aspect, which is the other side of what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoa, that's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, really excited, really excited to, to be able to teach this. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm gonna be learning too. I you know, I'm not I'm not teaching it because I consider myself the world expert on right. this. I want to learn more about it too. Right. So right. so I have to teach it. Yeah. So I can create that opportunity for everyone to to learn. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so vast. Uh, how could you stop learning about it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask about um, music as a political force. On this podcast, I've uh, at most flirted with this thing, even though it's obviously a thing that exists in music. Uh, during the lockdowns and the the uh, here in Canada, the convoy of truckers, the that was a big protest there. 
And um, it struck me all of a sudden how that was a musical event um, because the, the, there were horns blaring as a judgment against the government's um, actions. And in the tarot, the judgment card, it's horns blaring. And uh, the further in that pattern is uh, the walls of Jericho are brought down by horns, right? So, I mean, the everyday experience of linear time is not as dramatic as a story or a single image on a tarot card but looking back if you expand your perspective on time uh, you could see how this would be like one of those events right we'll see <laughs> but uh music that's like kind of like the the more esoteric end of music as a political force but obviously uh there's we you can understand this in more like kind of granular ways like uh, protest songs and uh how you know and and pro uh, protest musicians you know woody guthrie or you know has the famous this guitar kills fascists you know thing so music as a political force um that's that's as much as i'm feel confident talking about but um let's let i'll pass the puck over to you and you tell me about music as a political force okay yeah well, let, let's dive into that a little bit okay so because that's very germane to the musician's life today okay so music has the the documented empirical ability to bring together large masses of people right. we've seen that over and over again right? so what happens is that music rather than say music as a political force maybe we should say music uh, is appropriated as a political force. Right. So it's used to manipulate people. Mm -hmm. Whether the goal of that manipulation is seen to be a maleficent or beneficent goal, I mean, who's the judge of that? Right. But uh, even the and and how does it do that? And and this is a, a really mystical thing. Mm -hmm. Because not only do we have the aspects of music that are readily understandable to everyone in daily life, uh, the repetition of it, um, the, uh, the, you know, it's called the hook right the chorus of a song or the the hook of a song why is it called the hook because it grabs you you know mm -hmm. and this is also kind of an kind of an echo of the muse was it the muse terpsichore or was it a different muse who had the hook no thalia the the greek muse thalia she had a hook uh, like a crook uh staff mm. and this is why in vaudeville they would bring right. it off if you sucked, right? Yeah. You got the hook. <laughs> you were hauled off, you know. It's like Thalia didn't like you. Right. Okay. Right? So um we have the ability to coalesce large masses of people with the repetitions of music and the catchy melodies and and the rhythm rhythm is super important mm -hmm. that's, that's why they have drum circles which i hate to play with a drum circle because it's all <laughs> about it's all about you know bang bang and it's usually not sensitive at all 
Right. Okay. But, pe- but that's why people go to it. It's it's this kind of entrainment thing. And this is the metaphysical aspect that we have to talk about because uh, it's very she-she now to talk about brain waves and um, you know, hacking your brain waves and doing the binaural beats and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But that's a real thing. And there's people doing it to us. Right. So we have to understand what, what's going on. Hmm. Um, John Lilly, the guy that talked to dolphins. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you remember Dr. John Lilly, they made a, a movie about him called Altered States. It was like loosely based on his yes. life, right? The, about but, the sensory deprivation chambers. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he worked for the Navy. He worked, uh, or, yeah, he worked for the Navy. He worked for um, the National Institute of Health. You know, he worked for the government. Right. And uh, he was teaching dolphin communication and all this stuff. He invented a wave. It's not. It's known as the Lily Wave. Hmm. He invented this wave that has a uh, the ability to entrain the brain without damaging the neurons. Hmm. So. He was using this on the dolphins, but then he saw that they were, he didn't like the way the government wanted him to go, the direction that they wanted him to go with. He thought it was kind of abusing the dolphins and he loved the dolphins. Hmm. So he left that field and he continued independent research. Now this wave called the Lily wave, he was visiting a friend of his, also an uh, uh, researcher in frequencies. And this guy's name is Adam Trombley. So he's over Adam Trombley's house and uh, he wakes up and Adam has already turned on some equipment in his laboratory. And John Lilly looks at one of the screens and he's like, where'd you get that? There's this like a, a wave that's going across the screen. And Adam Trombley says, oh, I picked it up from the television. Oh, It's being broadcasted over the television. Hmm. I mean, this isn't like by channel. This is the, t- the television. The set. Has, the set itself. The, yeah. Hmm. It has this wave. Right. And John Lilly goes, well, that's my wave. I invented oh. that wave. Oh but to use with the dolphins and somehow, you know, government, the powers that be right. Because if you got to control communications to right. control people, right. The, the Nazis knew that mm-hmm. Albert Speer built a, an auditorium, especially with certain acoustical properties that would entrain people into alpha ways so that they would sit there and listen to Hitler's, boring speech be more influenceable yeah and so basically when you watch tv this this is why it's called the idiot tube and whatever but this is why you sit there kind of mindlessly in front of the tv because it's broadcasting this wave to capture your attention and to relax you Mm -hmm. and when you're in a yeah it's a a planned state yeah in a relaxed state you're more suggest uh prone to suggestion and um it's one of the if you look at the fbi cult checklist um it one of the things they say is uh do they use um you know techniques of entrainment and 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 if you don't know what those techniques are and if you don't know you're being entrained Mm -hmm. You know, I like to say, uh, you didn't think the Manchurian candidate was fiction, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, this, this is all stuff. The KGB, the CIA, they've been working on this for, you know, 70 years already. Come on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's all out there. If you go into a department store, 
you're being entrained. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you're not. It's not just the music, the music on the system, but there's also a subliminal audio track there that says, "Don't shoplift." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're receiving all of these suggestions, and it can get much more insidious than that. Mm -hmm. Can, can you imagine, I've seen videos of this, can you imagine the CIA going into some territory where they want to subdue people and mm -hmm. just blasting their brainwaves mm -hmm. with the frequencies that are going to achieve the goal that they want? Yeah. So we have to we have to understand that these technologies have become very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing that I want to cover in the metaphysics of music course because it's it's super important politi politically you know we're talking about music as a political force well there it is right there mm -hmm. frequencies being used to control our minds without mm -hmm. us knowing yeah and that is technically political as in uh political as in the related to the governing of people mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah so this, exactly yeah I, I understand what you mean yeah because you know I, before, sorry go ahead well when i hear that it sounds like spiritual warfare uh but it's it's political because the malevolent people who are malevolent in this um are not are not using it to to uh elevate anyone's spirit they're using it to subjugate people right yeah i right. understand what you mean yeah mm -hmm. yeah so we have that aspect of um political power of frequencies it's not political as in uh them damn democrats are doing this it's, it's... oh no no totally totally <laughs> no, no, beyond that yeah you're a, a several levels beyond that sort of shallow thinking yeah oh yeah that didn't even occur to me yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but um you know before they had those technologies then what did they have they only had the songs mm -hmm. so they used the songs Right. You know, George George M. Cohan, who, who's who was the composer of Over There and you know, all those patriotic songs that um were sung in in the in the twenties, right? Or in the I mean during the um first world war. So uh those songs were used to, you know, rally the troops and to rally patriotism amongst people mm -hmm. even today if you go in into a uh before a sports game or something and they sing the national anthem yeah and you have a feeling mm -hmm. you know that that your you, the national anthem of your country creates a feeling in you mm -hmm. even if you think patriotism is total bs mm -hmm. you're still going to have that feeling so why right mm -hmm. because you're being entrained yeah. in some in one way or another mm -hmm. and again it goes back to uh what music is music is always for something <laughs> there's no music that is uh uh that stands on its own it's for something uh, identifying what it is is confusing because we have so many uh, purposes, uh, uh, you know, um, and people are uh, operating across purposes, right? We're such an atomized world, you know, uh, that it's it's difficult to know what the music is for, especially if like the the for something is is actively being, you know, obfuscated. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Hmm. And well, it that... could be good things too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but um it takes some perception to realize when 
you're being controlled. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, do do I like this song just because I like this song? Or am I being told to like this song? Mm -hmm. And that's creepy when you think about it. Oh yeah. Mm. People talk nowadays about thoughts coming into their head that aren't theirs. Mm. You know, a thought comes into your head and you're like, why, why am I thinking that? I would never do that. Mm. These could be implanted thoughts. Yeah. Easily. So There's a, a passage in Tolkien. I, I love Tolkien. And it's Tolkien is actually very timely. Um, and I read... Uh, there's a there's a passage that goes um they're in a they're in a war and they're under siege and um the uh, everyone's starting to get demoralized and i believe it's gandalf that says uh that warns against that because the enemy uh has a weapon much greater than uh uh, hunger or or fear and that weapon is despair right <laughs> so right. if you if you don't know what's happening to you and it is happening to you then um it's easy to think that there's nothing you can do about it right that's yeah. an important point because you could be motivated by hunger you know if you're hungry you're gonna, you're gonna try to find some food mm -hmm. if you're if you're afraid of something you're gonna try to um uh, fight it or find a way to get away from it mm -hmm. so you're motivated to do that but if you're just in despair like you say you, you have no motivation mm -hmm. for anything and then that's that's when they've got you well, you've got a topic here that's called the enemies of music. I'm assuming uh, that's you've sort of touched on that, but uh, is there more to it than than what we've already discussed? Well, the biggest enemy. Uh, so let's talk about musicians for a second. Who's our biggest enemy? We are. Hmm. <laughs> um. We don't understand the power that we wield, so we give it away. Our ignorance, yeah. Yeah. Um, we continue to operate under working conditions that were dictated by other people who aren't musicians. Mm -hmm. We create all these... Uh, conditions for our for ourselves because we don't think about it hmm. and i understand that because we just want to focus on music right so we just say oh well that's just the way it is but the same way that we've been forced into doing our own advertising our own promotion our own flyers our own marketing our own outreach our own <laughs> recording you know, we we're doing everything ourselves over here now. Mm. You know, you try to make a video with somebody, like uh, do like um one of those side by side video. That takes a friggin' long time, and mm. you're trying to sync up the video and the audio, and you. you know, <laughs> oh man! And during the pandemic, we were all doing that, and we were spending hours and hours doing it unpaid hours right so there's just a lot on 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 our plates now mm -hmm. and so i understand when people say uh, i just want to think about the music that's it i don't want to do this this other thing mm -hmm. you know even just uh, i i know a great musician i was talking to the other day and he said you know i, I just can't I, I told him he should write a sub stack because he's a great writer. And, and he's like, I can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like, I can barely write an email. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Did I answer so, your question? I'm not really sure. Well, the enemies of music. I mean, it's yeah. So music. ourselves, we're yeah, we're creating these uh, conditions because we just accepting. Yes, exactly. It's this, and I've been harping on this thing ever since this blog and podcast. Um, it has to start with us accepting who we are and how much what well, um, not how much power but the the quality of the power that mm -hmm. we have and it's a difficult thing because when you when you really wrestle with the repercussions of that um most of us are going to find that we're not where we're supposed to be. And that's like tough. That's tough, man. <laughs> that's, and, uh, and, and then sometimes we're really not clear about where we're supposed to be. Like who says we're supposed to be somewhere. We get those ideas from outside mm -hmm. a lot of times and we internalize them. And I think a lot of times we shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. time time is a big enemy mm -hmm. and not only uh time in a linear sense in a daily sense of you know trying to find time to practice and find time to do all these different aspects of our career or whatever in addition to other responsibilities that we have with our partners and our uh, children and our pets and our properties and our jobs and whatever it is. So not only time in that sense, but also um, kind of cosmic time hmm. and, and epochs ah. and the zeitgeist. Right. So there's these big chunks of time that we're we're just kind of floating around in mm. and we're somewhat subject to those laws right. that are being created by those big blocks of energy mm -hmm. just because we happen to be existing uh during them mm -hmm. or in the midst of them so that's another one that comes to mind well here's a big question and I want the truth. <laughs> Are you hopeful? Yeah. I've expected you to answer that because why else would you be doing this course? Yeah, I'm not I'm not in despair. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really I'm not even afraid. Tell me more about that. I'm a little hungry though. <laughs> hmm. so um i just have this idea and this feeling and that's kind of backed up by conversations with that i have with colleagues and um videos and music that I see people putting out that's very, very metaphysical. Mm. Things that are, you know, I'm not the only one out here. There's a lot of people, a lot of musicians are exploring the metaphysics of music now, and maybe they don't call it that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what they're doing. And there's a lot of interest in sound and in, in alternate tunings. You know, if you go on the internet, you see this stuff about 528 hertz is the magic solfeggio number. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, 432 hertz is the, you know, instead of A440, they want you to tune to A432. And that's the magic, you know, 
nature frequency that we should have been tuned to. And it is true, the A that's used today, mm -hmm. we say A440, but actually a lot of orchestras are tuning to A442. If you go to Europe, don't be surprised to hear A444. It's such a pain. You know, you got a clarinet. I mean, you, it, it's not going to go in anymore. You right. know, you can't make it any shorter to match that pitch. So right. people have to buy new barrels that are shorter. You know, I my barrel used to be like this. Now it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. Just in the past 40 years that I've been playing the clarinet. I see. 50 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, the A was closer to 432 in 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 boxed time let's say yes the pitch is is rising you know but are the frogs and the crickets and the birds chirping to a 432 i don't know <laughs> i i don't know right. so there's a lot of crazy stuff that you see too i always say you can educate yourself on the internet but only if you're already educated right right <laughs> 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 but things are moving is what you're i'm hearing and things there's interest in this yeah, yeah people a, are a lot poking of people around and, yeah 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 and it's uh it's like uh when you're taking these first steps maybe as a kind of as a tribe of musicians you know we're gonna go in different directions and uh we're not all gonna know what we're gonna find but i get what you mean there's some we're we're uh oh what am i what's the word i'm looking for you know when you're in the dark and your hand you're with your hands you keep going like this because you know that's kind of how it feels and finally you find that light switch especially in a place you're unfamiliar with and then like everything comes comes becomes clear yeah yeah i think uh, ultimately uh, i believe that too and i think we have to be hopeful we in the sense that we have to be um that I, that may be what faith is you know if you there's reason to hope if you're hoping if you despair then there is no reason to hope right because it's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, and and this is another responsibility that we have to assume as not just as musicians as human beings we have to um understand ourselves to the degree that we know the dark part of ourselves the light part of ourselves we have to know everything mm. and and this is an ancient um axiom that's been repeated over the centuries, know thyself. So if we know ourselves, then we know when outside influences are coming in to try to change right. us. Right. So if you're a musician, then you have to apply that principle to your role of being a musician. And you you've just got to go deeper that's all i can say we we have to go much deeper mm. it's yeah. not just about uh melody and harmony and rhythm and dynamics and um repetition and uh retrograde inversion and um e flat 13 flat 9 you know, we got to go beyond all of that yeah it feels like it's time and I'm, I'm so glad you're putting out that invitation i have no doubt it will be uh answered and um you know when, when you do put get this done um you know update us how it went obviously i'm in canada i won't be able to go to ecuador but i have uh some friends who are from from ecuador in quito uh, oh, cool. So I definitely shared that with them. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure so, it will work out. I'm going to be teaching it in English. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unless, you know, 15 Ecuadorians sign up tomorrow. Okay. You got to <laughs> do some learning. 
<laughs> but um, we want uh, to attract an international audience. Right. Uh, yeah, so I we're, that, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in a few weeks, we're going to be putting this out to our European audience. So, uh, you know, English being kind of a, a common yeah. language yeah. amongst uh, many nations. So. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Exciting. Anything that uh, you wish I would have asked you about that I didn't or anything I forgot? Or... Uh, where's my course? Yes. Let's see. So we'll do, can I can I kind of run down some of the topics? Please. Just yeah. as a list. Yes. Okay. So you were asking about the functions of music and society. So under that uh, module, I have basic entertainment, dance, um, popular entertainment for the masses, um, sacred and religious music, meditative music. And that's a really big thing now mm -hmm. you know use it for med specifically for meditation sounds for meditation health and healing that's a topic we could talk about for a week straight sure, 24 yeah. hours a day mm -hmm. about how frequencies have been used for healing and there's some really interesting modalities coming out now um that are are dealing with that and using that as uh and and it's working for people. That's why there's more and more companies coming out with these kind of modalities. Um, then we have, of course, artistic, artistic function. There is an artistic function in society. We do have that, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes, hmm. but we do have it. Um, we do have people who are seeking that out specifically. Um, background music. So that's a very controlling thing the music that's being played in the elevator the music that's being played in the dentist's office um commercial music how is the music being used in uh in a commercial how's it being used as a soundtrack to a film hmm. how's it being used in a tv show the, you know the, the theme the theme to a tv show that plays hmm. every week that's this those aren't accidents those are specifically chosen for for these purposes mm -hmm. um then you have this kind of fetish aspect of music that's coming out now like as a as a ringtones or as nfts mm. this is kind of a fetishistic way it's like a primitive thing right that people are taking sounds and molding them into these little fetish objects like this ringtone on your cell phone you know mm -hmm. um that's so that's uh, the first three modules of my course now mm -hmm. obviously and i have a total of 15 modules so right. we and, start and it's these, over five days we start with that yeah but because i developed this as basically a semester's course right so what I'm doing is condensing um, information in so that we can fit it into a five-day course. And we also have a, an afternoon with Mauricio Vicencio, who's an um, amazing musician and shaman. Hmm. He's from Chile. He has Excellent. a group called Altiplano. And oh. he's going to be talking to the group about the functions of music in shamanic ritual, which is super fascinating. If you've ever been uh, in any ayahuasca ceremonies or anything, just to see, to hear, and to feel how important the music that's presented by the shaman, and usually it's them singing, playing guitars, and playing flutes, things like that. It totally controls the it manages the energy in the room mm -hmm. yeah i've heard of it the the ika rose 
Yeah, the Icaros are they're they're really amazing. And you feel when they're playing, you feel like they're saving your life. And maybe they are. Mm. Um, we have a, a section where I'm gonna be talking about the different tuning systems. Mm. And that's something that not only our our music lovers who, who don't play, but also a lot of musicians have no idea about different tuning systems. And they just assume this equal temperament system that we use today is is it. Mm -hmm. And it's not it at all. It's very far from it. (laughs) (laughs) It's just a way that was created to manage all the, to manage the way um, the uh, playing of music and the listening to, to music kept expanding and expanding over big swaths of people and genres and uh, commercial applications. Mm. Um, So that's a, that's a whole thing right there. But equal temperament is, it's just a, a system that was adopted so that more musicians could play together. Right. Yeah. But in the old days, you know, when, when you see, and and we st- still obviously play this music, if you see, you know, Handel, Sonata in F, you know, Concerto in B flat, why why did they put the key? No one does that now. Hmm. They had to do it then, because the song could only be played in that key. Hmm. Because that, that that's how the composer lined up the instruments because the right. instruments weren't, they weren't equal tempered. Right. They were playing, you know, according to the natural overtone series. So they could only play, the clarinet had to be playing here, and the French horn had to be playing here, and the flute here. And that's how the whole thing meshed together. If you take that sonata in F and you, you transpose it like they do today, oh, the singer wants to do it in F sharp. Oh, okay. Bring it up a half step. You couldn't do that. It would be so out of tune. Hmm. It's it, it it wouldn't work. So that's why the key had to be part of the title of the piece. And a lot of people don't have a yeah, clue about it. So I the, did I didn't know for sure. Yeah, it's it's heavy, you know, when you when you start looking at the tuning systems and yeah. And then how you know, pretty much every culture divides um, music into octaves. Right. So you have the, the the higher version of the note, the lower version of the note, but you know what you can hear. It's the same note. Mm-hmm. But we divide, different cultures divide that octave. Right, right. We have the octaves. same beginning and end point, same alpha and omega, but all everything in between is an infinite infinity that can be subdivided an uh, infinite number of ways. <laughs> right. So so imagine if you if you're a young musician and you've only dealt with equal temperament your whole life and now you get introduced to these other notes. I mm-hmm. mean that would be like being an artist and then discovering colors that you never knew existed. Yeah. Yeah. You would be you would immediately want to go out and start playing with those colors. Mm-hmm. You know. So there's you know one of my goals in in the course is to take people out of the loop right cuz loops are closed mm-hmm. you're not going to go anywhere in a loop you you have to we have to make those loops that we get into and we just fall into them it it happens mm-hmm. we have to take those loops and make them into spirals so that we can go out mm-hmm. And I have a lot of specific techniques that that I train to do that. Mm-hmm. So th- this is another thing that I want to offer people. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's wonderful and it's generous and very exciting. Yeah, it's uh, um, so that's uh, in August, August seventh. Yeah, so we start the seventh, but people will have to be there the night before. I mean, this is to Ecuador. Right. It's not, you know, Pittsburgh. 
<laughs> you gotta get your get yourself over to the Andes and uh you know get yourself locked in that uh set up in that hotel mm -hmm. before the course starts because we start eight in the morning you know you got breakfast at the hotel and then we're going to take you up to the mountain and we're going to start so really this the sixth is kind of the last day for people to get there and then we go for for that whole week so we end on the 11th we have a final concert and um we give out certificates of participation and stuff like that well this uh, i've often dreamed of the existence of this course really so, yes so for me the the fact that it's the it exists it is a dream come true and for real when i got your email and i, I read the email and i started looking at the course i i started crying it was such i was so happy that this is happening it's a real thing that's happening <laughs> <laughs> It's it's so cool. I'm so glad. Yeah. Wow, that's so encouraging. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was really great conversation. Um, we'll end it there if that's okay with you. Um, off the record, I got a couple of questions uh, okay. for, for you, and uh, but um, yeah, thanks a lot for this third appearance, and uh, I'm gonna keep an eye on this on this project and I, I want to know all about how it's going and everything. So yeah, great. Good job. I knew this was going to be right up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> You're <all> right. <laughs> okay. So we'll put the link uh, to the video and the, and the website. Everything. Your, yeah. Fantastic. And uh, Oh yeah. I'll make sure it's prominently displayed and uh, I'm going to send as many. I've already been talking to people I know about it. So. Um, yeah, we're going to do our best to to uh, promulgate this thing. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, perfect. Gotta change Thank the you. world. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>
your experience of life through music. This is a whole semester's worth of material that we've condensed into a five-day experience. We're only accepting 15 people because we want everyone to have a lot of involvement. Please email me with any questions. Music power. See you in August.